So I'm going to be talking about how I apply kind of the principles that I learned in this human-centered design course thread, these courses that I took that were relevant to it, and just talk about how that works in music. So the output of this project are some freely available 3D models that I designed of these musical instruments and components of musical instruments that anybody with access to a 3D printer can go out and make themselves. So there are two kinds of instruments that I made. One is kind of a standard or replica of parts for musical instruments. And the other, it kind of went deeper, is trying to experiment with new kinds of musical instruments. And the three courses that I'll talk about that are relevant to this course thread are Cogsci 1, which I feel like many people in the human centered design like this class a lot. This is one of my favorite classes that got me interested in cognitive science. And one of the themes that I think carried with me the most is the approach that is in cognitive science. So the interdisciplinary approach where you have any given problem and you can attack it from not just one aspect, but from a combination of disciplines that are not typically seen as related. And when you take this approach rather than a one directional approach, you can come up with more creative at times or more bridging kinds of solutions. And before I took Cox I1, I felt like I didn't really have a direction in terms of my interest. I feel like I had, I'm interested in music and maybe design, technical computer science, writing, whatever, all these things seem to be unrelated. But if you look at it in the way that cognitive science looks at it, this is very valuable if you have a lot of interest. You can kind of bridge together things that you might not have noticed otherwise. The other class I took, this was a summer course, very interesting course. Art 23 AC, so I took this for my American cultures requirement, but this is about American cyber cultures. So it kind of talks about the role of technology in culture and what are kind of challenges and benefits that come with technology. For example, what challenge might be not everybody can access this great tool that might be seen as universally beneficial, but if if it's only benefiting a certain group of people who can access it, you know, who is it really for? Is it really helping bridge gaps or is it making more? The other class that I took, this was special topics course in the business department where we did a semester long project. We developed a mobile app for IBM using IBM Watson. And this is something that kind of fostered a lot of design thinking or kind of applied design where we looked at use cases for different groups of people. How do you go out and design products for people's needs? And here's a video about the current manufacturer process for musical instruments. This is a standard. It's been this way for hundreds of years. That's the video. OK. So this is label mouthpieces. The mouthpiece is a part of the instrument that connects to the reed in wind instruments, and it makes the sound. So this is where you put your mouth on, blow into it. You can see the current manufacturer process is pretty slow. They have these really big mills that a trained technician has to operate. And if you want to come up with a new design, you have to know how to operate these things. You can't, any, any old individual can go and say, oh, I want to mount these with a wider a wider grip or with a bigger form. These are things that only these people can do. And these people are, as you might predict, working for the large kind of corporations of instrument manufacturers. So the knowledge that they have is pretty close. This is an intellectual property that they don't release easily. And the point of this video is just to see it's pretty complex. It takes a long time to make even one time. And how much do you think one of these mouthpieces cost? $20? No, $242. I mean, they're quality mouthpieces, but I remember when I first was out to buy like a next step mouthpiece, I thought, okay, I have like $50, I want to buy a nice mouthpiece. No, how can this little like two inch piece of plastic be that much? Well, it's because it's a very involved manufacturing process. That's not the most expensive. They get crazy expensive because there are a lot of little tweaks that you can do 
that create a difficult manufacturing process but might improve the sound. And this is the structure of a typical mouthpiece. You have the tip, and all these are basically just a lot of parameters that affect the tone in small ways that if you're, if you're in the business of like, playing music a lot, you might care about these because you're checking for a specific tone that you want to go for as a musician. So musicians mostly know about this, but we don't know how to make our own instruments difficult. So how can we get past that difficult you know, large manufacturing process with 3D modeling? So if you apply it with, if you have a knowledge of what you want and you have a software of 3D modeling, you can create your own some mouthpieces. So here, this is, I modeled this in Autodesk Fusion 360. It's uh, very intuitive for entry level uh, 3D modelers. Here's a mouthpiece. And you can't see the details because of the lighting, but over there you can see that the bore, which is the shape of the hole, is a triangle shape. So that's not typical in a, in a mouthpiece that you could manufacture by hand because there's an extending lip that you can't put a, a mill to do that. You would have to carve it out by hand. This is not done in manufacturing. So I'll show you some more of this. This is something that I've will put out to be freely available. It's a blank, so this is just a rough shape of a mouthpiece, and with some basic steps, you can modify this if you're a musician to do whatever you need to affect the sound of it. So if you know that you want a mouthpiece with a, a lip, which is the top part that is very, very curved, and you can just simply, there are points on the side that you can curve, and anybody can now customize them with some entry-level training in the software. These are two different kinds of mouthpieces, which I have here. This is the one I was telling you with the triangular bore. This is not possible with traditional manufacturing. This one is, has, if you can see, a very wide, and in the picture, it's a very wide window, which is here. You see the difference? This one has a little window. This one has a very wide one. This affects the sound of it. It's supposed to be louder. And I mentioned that the square bore, that's the one that I have here, very large window, triangular bore a new kind of form. These are two of the things I made. <laughs> the other part is a clarinet body. So you see this is clarinet, typical clarinet. And there are two models that I made. One of them is of the bell, which I have in here. It's not that exciting, it's just a little, little bell. This helps project the tone this doesn't, or this doesn't have that much to do with the tone of your instrument, it just makes it louder. If you had a clarinet without a bell, it would be smaller and muffled. This just, because of the shape of it, it helps uh, multiply or bounce back the waves. The material of this doesn't matter that much. That's why you can replace the, the typical one with a 3D model one, and it'll be very, very similar and a lot more cost effective. The mouthpiece, as I mentioned, is a very good mouthpiece. Now, here's a more experimental kind of design. These were already kind of pre-existing. Things have mouthpieces, things have bells. But there's a traditional Armenian instrument called a duduk, which has two reeds. And it has no mouthpiece. It just has two reeds that vibrate against each other. And it kind of has a large learning curve. It's difficult to make these, these double reed instruments play, play well. And they're not very accessible. Yeah, these are often handmade, and people don't really know about them. They have very similar tone to a clarinet, except that you know, it's a different way of blowing into it. So if you wanted to play one, it's uh, not very accessible. This, I made, is a duduk that connects to a typical clarinet mouthpiece. And here is the body. And it sounds similar to what a duduk should sound like. This, is a, this only has five, five notes, which makes it a pentatonic, and it's, tone, it's tuned to C. You can make it sharper, flatter by pulling these and making the two bigger or making the two smaller. So I'll just play a little demo so you get some idea of what it sounds
This is very cheap to make the, the ink or not the ink, the, the material for a 3D printing is two cents per gram. It's very, very cheap. So as 3D printers become more accessible, entry-level 3D printers are maybe $500. A typical family in the United States might be able to afford that. And as they become even cheaper, you won't have to spend hundreds of dollars, maybe two hundred dollars, you might buy a do. Well now you just have a manufacturing center in your home. And this can help if maybe in a parallel, like a large, you have a big farm of 3D printers, I don't know if that's possible right now, but you can put these out very quickly and extend them to places that normally you <coughs> The other one that I made is a soprano saxophone. This is an interesting thing. So if you've ever seen a regular soprano saxophone, they're kind of a straight like this, but they have a bunch of keys on them. And this one has some keys too, except kind of in the design process, I, I tested it out and I figured the keys don't do anything because the math that I did with the volumes and stuff was a little wrong. So <laughs> uh, I cover, if I cover this up and just cover the keys, then it's just a keyless saxophone. That's fine because the inventor of the saxophone, his first saxophones were keyless, and all you did, all you did was that you modulate the pitch with your throat, and then you can play all the notes like that. And this sounds like that, but I don't have all the equipment to demo it right now. Keyless or common saxophone, anybody with, this can fit a regular size 3D printer because it comes in two pieces. And here's the kind of complete line of things that I made. I call it, I call it liberato, which means uh, it's the state or quality of being free. And I think that with 3D printing and the rapid prototyping that an individual musician can do, as opposed to it being, as opposed to the creativity being in the hands of companies, it can now be to be an individual musician. And this will kind of be able to free up the potential for different kinds of innovation. Here it is. Bravo. Any questions? Any questions? Rebecca. So I think, is, is it true that everything made on a 3D printer is essentially made of plastic? And does that affect the way the instrument sound because that's not a traditional material for mm -hmm. instrument? Most 3D printers print different kinds of plastic, so it's mostly just varieties of plastic. These are on PLA, which is just a plant-based plastic, which has certain properties. There are also 3D printers that print metal. Some are, they're very, they're not accessible right now, but they exist and are emerging. But the plastic doesn't affect the, it doesn't make it that much different than a traditionally made one, because what they're made of is essentially a different kind of plastic. They're ABS, which we have printers on campus that do that, but I don't have access to them, so I didn't use that plastic. But there's very similar properties to the other one, except the one that I use is plant-made, plant which makes it biodegradable, which is not the best thing if you're going to be putting your mouth enzymes on it. It might fall apart after a little bit. But the tone is not affected that much by the material. Why did it do? Is it, well, yeah, why did it do? Why did it do? So, why did it do? <laughs> <laughs> so I initially was thinking about how do I modify a clarinet. I wanted to make a whole clarinet out of 3D printing. And I, I was thinking, I just wanted to do something interesting that brought a new kind of new instrument that people don't normally have access to. People don't, haven't heard of the Dukes often. So it seems very bizarre when someone hears about a Duke and I kind of wanted to to bring that more commonplace so that you can, can hear about it and just become educated about different kinds of world instruments. I think that's the result of this if this is known and people will be more interested in that rather than a typical instrument. Could you pursue yeah. this being implemented in elementary schools so that kids can have more exposure and maybe students who couldn't afford to buy instruments now, if they were 3D printed at a cheaper price, could learn at a younger age? How to play. If you see that. Definitely. That's something that I think, I don't know how many elementary schools have 3D printers, but I know some might. And if you, I mean, kids can 3D print right now. So I think it's a great education device that you can kind of make it. I think the typical introduction to music is if you've ever heard of recorders, 
the little plastic one. So this would be about the same price as the recorder. You might have a more like more advanced kind of instrument that has more sound possibilities than the recorder, which is, has a lot of issues. So I definitely foresee that <laughs> as a potential application. And it can also be a, a computer kind of intro to 3D modeling. If people are, we make the software, the software's designed to be very accessible. It's not perfect yet, it's kind of a lot of bugs, but if you can have children design their own instruments and then play them, then that'd be great. And then one more question, was it physically possible to 3D print a guitar? People 3D print guitars, they, they do? Yeah. Wow. yeah. If you look up the 3D printed guitars, people, I think the main application of it is you can get designs that aren't possible with the regular manufacturing. 